<laughs> Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. How are you? <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, I guess we'll get started here. Uh, so welcome everyone to the final speaking session of the afternoon. Uh, my name is Caden Thornton and I'm a member of the Western Mustangs Ringette team. This session will last about 40 minutes. Uh, speakers will take a break at 15 to answer a few questions and then return to their presentation and we'll conclude with a few more questions. Following this session, we will wrap up our Stay in the Game conference. Uh, I encourage you to use the chat function to generate questions uh, and conversation as well. This is how you will communicate. Only presenters and moderators will have access to the audio visual components. Uh, please use the chat function, ensuring session chat is selected to communicate and ask questions throughout this session. Um, I am pleased to introduce Teresa Bohr, who is presenting this session on how to use your sport, ex sport experience to build your resume. Teresa holds a Bachelor of Applied Science degree from the University of Guelph, where she specialized in family studies. She continued her education at Fanshawe College, where she received a certificate in human resource management. Today, Teresa is a career educator at Western University, specializing in career and job support. Uh, she focuses on building capacity, establishing connections, and gaining the skills necessary for success in the workplace. Teresa oversees Western's Employment Resource Center Center, and she facilitates workshops on resume and cover letter development. With us here today, Teresa will expand on how to effectively use sports experience to build your resume. We are pleased to welcome Teresa Bohr to today's breakout session. Hi, Kaden. Thanks so much for that introduction. Uh, so yeah, I do a lot of resume presentations, but this is the first time I've used Hop In. So there's a little bit of like anxiety and stress as I'm trying to get into the session and figure out how to use it. So I'm just going to try and share my screen. Here we go. And my screen. There we go. There it is. Okay. So thank you. Um, I'm just going to grab something really quick. Okay, so yes, uh, thanks for attending this session today on how to use your sport experience when building a resume. So I just happened to join the conference um, at the lunch uh, networking session today and I happened to be speaking with someone from Alberta and then I spoke with somebody who is from a different region of Ontario. And so it was really a pleasure to speak with people from all over the place. And so wherever you are <laughs> located today, um, you know, whatever location that is, or even within your own space, whether it's your study space or your kitchen table or maybe even your couch. I hope you're comfortable and I hope that uh, today's session um, gives you some insight and you can pick up a, a few tips on the, the information that's presented today. So uh, just a little bit more background about what I do um, as a career educator at Western. I meet with students individually in one-on-one -on -one meetings and I also do these workshops, but essentially I help students with what comes next after Western. So sometimes that means applying to grad school, sometimes it means um, job search strategies, and sometimes it means polishing interview skills, and sometimes it means just figuring out what that next step is because not everyone knows uh, where their passions lie and we don't even really buy into that whole, you have to have a passion thing. <laughs> it's more about, you know, what, what you're curious about and what challenges you want to work on in life and that your degree, your degree doesn't necessarily define where you go with your career. So we help students with that, navigating that career exploration piece as well. So for today's session, um, I welcome you to, to open your resume if you have a document um, already and uh, make some edits possibly as we move along through the session. Or if you don't even have a resume started yet, maybe you could just open a blank document and um, use some of the tips and insights that are offered today and start building your document uh, that way. Okay, so um, what is going to be covered today is, um, obviously resumes, but I'm going to speak specifically about three uh, easy to remember guidelines that can be helpful for you. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, some resources that are available to you uh, at Western uh, where you can access this information. And then lastly, of course, as you know, there's a period of time available halfway through and then at the end for some Q&A. But uh, what I really would like to get started with is some um, myths and facts, myth or fact, I suppose, <laughs> in terms of what are people thinking in terms of um, resumes and how they're, how they're developed. Okay, 
So um, let's get started with this piece here. And let's look at some myths or fact. So here's the first one. What I'd like you to do is maybe just pop into the chat. What do you think? Paid work experience must be separated from unpaid slash sport or volunteer experience, which could also be slash sport because sometimes we do things related to sport that are volunteer. So just pop into the chat. What do you think? Myth or fact? I like that fact with a question mark. <laughs> I'm sure. It's good. Okay. Any other thoughts? Fact? Okay, looking like a little bit of both here I, on the ideas. So um, let's have a look. It's in fact a myth. You don't. You, it's really about how creatively you use the headings on your resume. Um, you can simply, rather than separating out with work experience and then volunteer experience, you can use a generic term of experience or relevant experience, which is a pretty useful term. And I'll get to that a little bit later as we move along through the presentation. Just another one. There are no standard rules regarding the length of a resume. Myth or fact? What do you think? You can pop that into the chat. Lots of myths here. Okay, it's looking like a unanimous myth. <laughs> okay, it's actually true. There, there are some guidelines, and, and I, I think, you know, actually, now that I think about this, it, this could be a little bit of true and a little bit of false, because there definitely are some industries that there are specific rules. So, for example, if you're interested in working in, in a business environment, business would probably say a one-pager is, is the must. However, if you're applying to work with the federal government in Canada, they have no, they don't care. Your resume could be five pages long. Somebody will read it. As long as the information is relevant, that's what's useful to them. They don't care how long it takes you to tell them your story. They'll read it. In general, we think that you know one to two pages is, is the norm, but that's not a rule anywhere, okay? One to two pages is a norm. It is recommended though that if you have more than what you um, can fit on one page, that you try to stretch it to two pages because one and a half pages looks incomplete or one and a quarter pages. So it should be a full page. So one full page or two full pages is the norm, but again, not necessarily the rule, but that depends on the industry. Okay, the next one. Oh, I gave this one away. Ah, the statement of reference, <laughs> the statement references available upon request should always appear at the end of your resume. So here you know this one is a myth. There's no reason for this anymore. This is kind of a dated thing that we see on resumes and it takes up valuable space on your resume. And it's kind of understood that if an employer is calling you in for an interview that you should bring your references with you. Next one here. It's okay to use both past and present tense on your resume. What do you think of this one? Myth or fact? It's okay to use both past and present tenses on your resume. Here. Yeah, you're right. It is in fact true. So it's something that's occurring in the present, something that you're still doing now, can be listed in the present tense and clearly something that you've done previously would be listed in the past tense. Okay, just one more. Tailoring your resume for each specific, specific job is a waste of time. The employer will extract what they're looking for. What do you think of this one, myth or fact? Lots of myths coming through. So this one is in fact a myth. It's critical, it's absolutely critical that you customize your resume and make it relevant to the position you're applying to. The employer needs to see explicitly how you fit what they're looking for. Okay, so I'll get into some of these as we move forward through the presentation. Um, and so uh, let's move ahead with that. Got a little cartoon for you here. 
So this is meant to give you some insight uh, about uh, being cautious about what you find online and uh, what you choose to put into your resume. It's really important that your resume speaks to you in particular. <laughs> I'm going to give you a little personal anecdote here. When I first left university, I had a job with an organization and I was applying internally for another position. And so I was brushing up my resume a little bit. And I uh, came across uh, a statement that I thought sounded pretty catchy. I was trying to find something that was unique. And I said in my summary of qualifications, I said that I was sharp. <laughs> and I've never forgotten this. I was sharp and creative in needs assessment and problem solving. And I thought it sounded pretty good because I did, I did problem solving a lot in my job. So anyway, I was in the interview for this internal position. And the, rec the recruiter said to me, Teresa, this is a really interesting and kind of a catchy, um, unique statement on a resume. I haven't seen this one before. Tell me about your creativity and your sharpness in problem solving and needs assessment. And so here's me with the deer in the headlights look trying to answer this question that really did not speak to um, you know, something that I did creatively in this job. I did a lot of problem solving, but could I say that it was creative or unique in any way? I'm not so sure. So just a little heads up for you that if you're going to be looking online for some resources and some uh, examples of things that you might include in your resume, speaking from an athletic point of view, make sure what you're finding speaks to the truth of who you are, make it unique and not just something that you find that sounds great online. All right, so let's look at some guidelines for an effective resume. Um, we have here, the first guideline is that it needs to be relevant. Your second guideline, your resume needs to show your accomplishments. And your third guideline is that your resume needs to be easy to read and without errors. So you have to appreciate that there's, there's subject, subjectivity around resumes, writing them as well as reading them. So you could ask 10 different people to look at your resume and give you feedback, and you could get 10 different opinions on what people are thinking. And so in our careers and experience office at Western, um, our, we, we feel that these guidelines are the best way to go. Um, so how you actually style your resume is up to you. As long as your resume shows your relevant skills, it shows your accomplishments rather than just listing your duties, and it's inviting to read and it doesn't have any errors in it, you, you have what you need and the rest is up to you to figure out how to polish it so that it's unique for you. So um, let's break these down uh, specifically into what that means. We're gonna look at relevancy first of all. So if you're applying to a job, to a position where there has been a uh, job posting or, or some kind of a job description available to you, Think of that as your gift. This is the employer's gift to you because they are telling you specifically what they're looking for. They're telling you the skills and the experiences that they're after. It's your job to tell them how you meet those skills and experiences that they're looking for. So what I recommend that you do is you take the resume or, or sorry, you take the job posting or the job description and you highlight the skills and the experiences the employer is looking for and then you take your resume and you put them side by side and see, are you listing the skills that, they're, that they've asked for and the experiences that they've asked for, if in fact you have them? Okay. Because um, your, your resume is not a document that tells the employer everything about you. It tells them what's relevant about you and the value that you can bring to their position. Okay, so um, and when you're building your resume, you always start with the most relevant first. So your, your whole resume should be relevant. But when you're building your document, you start with the most relevant and then you work down from there. Think of your document as that, um, let's call it the top one third of your page. The top one third of your page is your high real estate piece. That's where the employer starts looking and that's where you want to hook them to keep on reading further. And so everything they're going to see is relevant but that high real estate section is the important piece that you need to catch their eye and make them want to consider to keep looking. Now I wanna stop for a second and speak specifically here about how um, this ties into your experience in sport. So it's important to think beyond your titles, whether it's a job title or your, um, you know, your sports, so what you're working on. So you gotta think beyond that, um, and, and include the experiences you've had outside of the classroom. And so how, how do you do this though? How do, you, how do you think about and reflect on your experiences? 
So I might suggest to you that consider the role you have on your team or think about how your coaches or your teammates might describe you. Okay. Um, you know, and when I think of when I'm when I'm working with students who are um, who are athletes, um, we talk a lot about the skills they gain from their experiences. And so, you know, this ranges from things being like dedicated or committed. You know, um, it's, it's a certain level of commitment that we don't find amongst the other student population necessarily. And so what are some what are some attributes that come from that? I think about strong work ethic. I think about being goal oriented and organized and having strong time management abilities to be able to balance your practice schedule and your competition and travel schedule uh, with your academics. I think that uh, teamwork is an important part of sport. And, and part of that includes being a supportive person, being a collegial or a collaborative person, having strong interpersonal skills. I think of athletes as bringing leadership uh, to the table. I think that they have strong communication skills. They're dependable. Um, they're strategic thinkers. They can make quick and effective decisions. Right? Um, they're able to accept constructive criticism, which is really big in a workplace, especially when you are potentially doing an internship or if you're new. You know, being able to uh, accept feedback that's given to you in order to be able to improve your performance is very important and very transferable to the workforce. Athletes are adaptable. Athletes show perseverance. Athletes show in incredible concentration and focus and ability to handle pressure. Uh, athletes inspire confidence. And so some of these skills are the things that you can talk about from your sport experience and incorporate those into your resume, ensuring that they're relevant in terms of what the employer is asking for for their position, okay? So that's one tip. And a second tip that I might ask and suggest to you when you're thinking about the relevancy of your experiences is to, we talk about the idea of customizing your experiences to every position that you're applying to. So that doesn't mean you have to rewrite your resume every single time you're applying to a new job. Sometimes little tweaks here and there are enough. And so what I want to do now is show you an example of what that looks like. Let's take this statement here. Okay, this one says that, um, you uh, maybe an example could be that you initiated and developed a mentorship program for new team members to support their transition to varsity athletics. This is a pretty rich statement that you'd find on a resume. Um, but you can spin this a couple of different ways depending upon what you want to emphasize. So if maybe in the job description it talks about that they want to hire somebody who has demonstrated experience of, of showing impact, that they want people who are impactful and, and make it, um, differences in their job. So an example of that might mean this, that you take the first statement and you spin it to this, that you developed a mentorship program for team members that supported the transition of varsity athletics, which enhanced their skill development and the overall team success. Or maybe they want someone with effective teamwork skills. And so you can say something like this, that you collaborated with multi-sport upper year student athletes to develop and implement a mentorship program for new team members to ease their transition to varsity athletics. So you see, you don't have to rewrite everything right from scratch. You can simply take what you have and spin it different ways depending upon what you're trying to uh, demonstrate to the employer. Okay, I wanna stop for a second here and, whoops, let me go back. Here, I want to stop for a second and talk about applicant tracking systems. Um, and, um, not everyone knows what an applicant tracking system is. So I'm just going to take a second to explain that this is software that uh, some employers use, generally large employers. So companies that would typically get hundreds and hundreds of resumes for each position they advertise. And so they use this. Uh, as a tool to help screen uh, the resumes and bring them down to a short list of candidates. So sometimes the first thing that's not seeing your resume isn't a person, it's a computer and it's parsing your document looking for specific things. So how do you get past that? Um, strategies that we recommend are using keywords. So again, looking at that job description or that job posting, finding the skills the employer has asked for, making sure those skills are used. If you have those skills, making sure those exact words are used in your document because this is what the employer is looking for. So clearly they're going to program um, uh, uh, the scanning tool to look for those specific words. 
It's also recommended that you make sure you have no spelling mistakes, which of course is recommended regardless if you're being screened by an applicant tracking system or not. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a computer system. It's not intuitive. It can't figure out what you're trying to say. It can only understand what you are saying. It's also recommended that you use a current year in your resume rather than the word present. Okay, so if you, 2021 is the year you're going to graduate, then put the year 2021 so that they can see that there's something current on your resume. We also recommend that you don't use heavy formatting or columns or tables because the, the software reads left to right and it's not clear that it knows what to do when it gets to something that's formatted to show that it's a column. Bullet points, making sure you use very standard bullet points, you know, not the one that looks like a circle with a little another circle inside it, like a donut. You don't want that one, or you don't want the ones that look like check marks or arrows. Just use very standard items so that the, the computer knows um, in generally use the common things that a computer, um, they programmed it to know what it is. So you know when you're applying through an applicant tracking system, if you are uploading your resume, and then when you go to click submit, it asks you to basically put the same information into specific text boxes. Guarantee you that's an applicant tracking system. So you need to ensure that um, you're being strategic in how you are submitting your document because it's not going to a person initially. Okay. Um, Number two, step number or, or tip number two, guideline number two is showing your accomplishments. So it's really important to show the outcomes of your work. I cannot tell you how many times I see resumes where people list their duties. And in fact, I was doing a search of athletic resumes, varsity athletic resumes, uh, vars or res sorry, resumes for varsity athletes um, as I was leading up to preparing my presentation. And I thought, I wouldn't use these. I would not recommend how some of this information is provided because so many people list their duties. They say what they were responsible for. They say what their job, you know, uh, what their job description might list as what their duties are. That does not show the employer how well you can do that task, nor does it show them the benefit of you doing that task. And so if you want to stand out amongst a sea of other candidates, amongst a pile of resumes that are sitting on a recruiter's desk, one of the easiest ways to do that is to show your accomplishments rather than just listing your duties. So I'm going to give you a couple examples of what that looks like. Um, Teresa, may I? Okay. First thing we want to do um, is... We, we're I'm just sorry? about at the 15-minute mark, um, so we'd love to take the opportunity to give the audience a chance to ask you some questions if they have. If anyone would like to put anything sure. in the chat at this moment... Um, maybe we can start with my own question here. Uh, you did mention how if you're at an a, a half page on your resume, it does look a little bit incomplete. So I was wondering what suggestions you could give for fluffing up your resume to fill that uh, full page. Mm -hmm. So some suggest that's a great question because lots of people run into that problem, right? So some suggestions would be to play with your margins a little bit. Sometimes you can make them a little bit bigger. Um, sometimes you can, uh, you know, some make your heading like your brand that includes your name and your contact information you could make that bigger it's definitely recommended you also have that branding on the second page of your document so um it, it, it uh it also takes up a few lines if you do that um so you can move your indents like when you're using bullet points to describe your experiences you can indent them a little bit more so that it takes up uh, and maybe a second line sometimes or a third line in order to be able to describe that so on our website at career.uwo.ca career.uwo.ca you'll find there uh we have a resume section there and we have you know 12 different kinds of resumes that are listed and i would recommend you have a look at how some of them are formatted because you can see that some people have been creative with where they have their tabs and where they have their margins and how they present their their their, their branding at the top using more than two lines some people choose to use three lines or four lines to get all that information in in order to take up some space Mm. Very much. Um, and then also, uh, which individuals mm. in your athletic circle would you consider the most effective as uh, references? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking there, um, references, uh, lots of employers want to know from um, people who've, who've been your supervisors, or in this case, your coaches, or people who have uh, are not your peer, 
right? People who are in a leadership capacity. And so it could, if you're not the captain of the team, it could be the captain, it could be the coach, it could be the assistant coach, it could be a trainer. So someone who is able to speak to your abilities from a leadership level. Um, we have another question here. Um, how old can experience be when you put it on your resume? Mm -hmm. So um, I guess this depends on the individual, right? But I'm, I'm going to suggest, you know, it, you could go back as, as many as five, seven, ten years, depending upon how, how extensive it was. You know, if you did it once 10 years ago, I wouldn't recommend that. If you did it extensively within the last, you know, seven to 10 years, that could be something that you could put on your resume. It's, you know, we talk about education a bit in terms of what to include for your education. Like once you're in university, you probably really should be shouldn't including high school anymore even though you may have had some um, really outstanding athletic uh, experiences in high school or academic or other experiences in general, once you get to university, you don't necessarily uh, include that anymore with the exception in first year for sure, especially this first year where it's been so unique with pandemic living, you could definitely include high school experiences probably even into second year, but once you're beyond second year, you wouldn't be including high school ex experiences anymore. It's not typically something that you would do. Thank you. Um, and then I think that concludes our question at the moment. We will revisit questions at the end of your presentation. Sure, thank you. Okay, so um, now when we're looking at um, how you go about writing an accomplishment statement, um, the first thing to do is reflect, right? So think about a time when maybe you made a difference. So in your job, in your sport, um, on a team that you were on, what was it and how did you make that happen? Possibly think about a time maybe when you saved some money. Uh, for your organization, possibly your team or your club. Maybe there is a time when you had some success in a competition or when you were organizing a, an event or an initiative that had a positive outcome. Maybe you received recognition or a strong performance in something or a job well done. So, so give that reflection uh, some time to, to percolate and, and uh, see what you can come up with. But here's an example for you that we'll work through. So teaching swimming lessons to children, uh, this was a very rewarding experience and the person bonded well with the children. They looked forward to coming to classes even though they were early on Saturday morning. So this isn't a resume statement. This is just like an experience and thinking about uh, how that went for that particular individual. Okay, now let's look at this. Let's break this down into how we turn this into a statement that you would put on your resume. So the first thing you would do is think about what was the challenge here? What was the problem or the issue that you faced? And in this case, it was engaging children in early morning Saturday classes. Think about the action that you took. And so what does this mean? Like, how did you respond to the problems or issue? What, what, um, what skills did you use? This is a really effective, play, effective place to toss in all those skill words. You know, when I mentioned um, the variety of skills you gain as an athlete, this is a great way, a uh, great spot to be tossing those skills in there. And in this scenario, with the teaching the swimming lessons, uh, this person had to develop some creative activities and using a customized approach when they were communicating with the kids, because not everyone is going to respond the same way in a classroom or, or in a class setting. It's not a room, it's a pool. And then the last one is the result. So what was the benefit of your action? So in this case, in this scenario, uh, the children, they enjoyed the classes, they had some fun, they learned techniques, and they gained their skills, and they also gained confidence. Okay, so that's the breakdown. So we knew this experience about the Saturday morning lessons. We break it down into a challenge, an action, and a result. And then we pull all that together to make a, um, a statement for a resume. And so what does that look like? Um, <clears throat> so here we go. It could be that you could say something to the effect of that you taught swimming lessons to children. That's the challenge. Utilizing creative activities and adapting communication styles to the needs of each child. That's the action. And what was the result? Resulting in skill development and improved confidence. Let's look at another one. Possibly that you could say that you committed 25 or more hours, training hours per week while you're studying a full course load. Now, most people would stop there. I see a lot of this on the resume. They would just stop there. Committed 25 plus training hours per week while studying a full course load. That's a statement of 
of duty, right? That's that's a responsibility that you had. It doesn't show the employer the depth of the skills that you used, nor the accomplishment. So let's go further from that. So improving your technique and performance, achieving first place in the division finals. Okay, so, and again, same thing with the swimming lesson. Most people would say taught swimming lessons to children and they would leave it at that. But you know, you need to be able to tell the employer a little bit more about you and then what the outcome was. And that's a more effective way to, um, uh, to, to showcase the skills that you can offer. Okay, on our website, we have a resource called Skill Action Verbs. And these are skills where you wanna talk about your, um, as I mentioned, all the, all the other experiences that we talked about, like your decision-making, your perseverance, your communication, your leadership, your um, you know, um, confidence and conflict management and uh, strategic thinking, all those kinds of things. I want to encourage you to consider moving beyond words um, when you're when you're writing the statements on your resume. Moving beyond words like participated, um, helped, worked, worked in, worked on. These are very vague, and they don't tell the reader much about you. So when someone tells me that they participated in, um, you know. Uh, post-game debrief sessions. What does is, what is participated mean? Does that mean you took notes? Does that mean you brought the coffee? Does that mean you were an active contributor to moving uh, the decisions forward? Participated is just too big. You don't want to use words like that, okay? So try and think of these skill words. And if you're stuck, there's a resource on our website at career.uwo.ca that can uh, provide you with some support with that. Okay. Third guideline keeping your document easy to read. I want to <laughs> give you a little bit of a heads up here in that um, most employers take six seconds to scan your resume. I'm gonna say that one more time, six seconds. They scan your resume. That's why we call it the high real estate piece of your document at the top one third. You need to catch them and you need to encourage them to keep on reading. Okay, so the six seconds is a scan to decide I've got time for this or I don't have time for this because they have a stack of resumes that could be 50 or 100 deep on their desk and they don't have a vested interest in any of you. These are just pieces of paper in front of them. So you make the yes pile or you make the no pile. And so ensuring that your document is easy to read and clearly that it doesn't have errors is a benefit to help you getting into the yes pile. Don't make them work for information because they won't. They won't look for it. Okay, how do we how do we make it decluttered? How do we make it look better? So some suggestions here are that um, I talked about margins before with the question about how do I get my my document to two pages if I only have a page and a half of information. Um, you don't want to have too much white space, right? You you want to make sure there's a lot of um, that the that your statements go from left to right quite nicely, and that there's balance to your documents. You want to make sure that um, uh, there is line line spacing is consistent, that it's easy for them to find what they're looking for. That uh, section headings are bold typed quite nicely, and they they stand out a little bit bigger in your font size. You want to ensure that you don't have, you know, seven bullet points underneath any of your experiences. Probably three to four would be sufficient. And if you think you can't fit it all in in three or four bullet points, then maybe you need to make your bullet points a little bit longer. That being said, you don't want paragraphs, right? You don't want something that's five or six lines long per bullet point. You need to make sure that there's balance and it's readable. It's also suggested that you don't use acronyms unless you've identified it in full. So uh, for example, if you're studying a Bachelor of Science that you actually type out Bachelor of Science, don't call it a BSc. Or if you're in BMOS, that you don't call it BMOS, that you actually say, um, you know, Business Management Organizational Studies. And so you list it in full what it is. Don't, don't assume that the employer knows what it is. This is also very true when you're talking about scholarships and awards. Don't assume the employer knows what you got the award for or what the award is. You could say that you received X scholarship for X amount of dollars, but if it's not clear what it is, there should be some description of that as well so they can understand the depth of your skill and your, and your, and your achievement in that case of getting the scholarship. Okay, let's look at some spell checker nightmares. You don't want to rely exclusively on uh, tools that are available to check your spelling and your grammar because these are some of the nightmares that come out of it. 
check out this one, instrumental in ruining the entire operation for a national retail chain. I think it means running, <laughs> but uh, ruining gets um, picked up through the spell check or it, it clears the spell checker because it's a real word. Here's another one um, for your skills, possibly strong work ethic, attention to detail, team player, self-motivated, attention to detail. You know, the first thing I'm thinking is that you do not have attention to detail, but of course this doesn't get picked up on a spell or a grammar check. Next one could be a um, couple here, job duties, providing superior in-person customer service using the telephone. And I love this one, received a plague for track team athlete of the year. Clearly meaning track <laughs> comes up with plague. So how do you get around this? How do you get around this? You want to read your resume. You want to read your words out loud a few times. You want to put it, put it aside and come back to it with fresh eyes because that way you're seeing what it says, not what you think it should say. Clearly ask other people to look at it for you. Someone that you trust that can pick up, uh, has that attention to detail and can pick up the mistakes. And then there's also um, resources like um, text-to-speech uh, um, resources within a computer. I know if you have an Apple, you can highlight the content and then click option and escape and it will read it for you. The computer will read it for you. Your device reads it. So different uh, options there, but I mean, I know people <laughs> who, who do recruiting who say they see a spelling mistake, it's done. They don't even bother going any farther. I personally am a little more forgiving in that regard, but there's lots of people who aren't. So again, resumes are subjective. So, you know, why are you going to take that chance? Make sure that your, your document speaks for you very, in the, very well. All right, let's move on and look at a sample resume. Okay, so this one um, is one that, uh, I, it's not on our website, but um, I played with it a little bit of a couple that I've seen on our website and seen through the years. And so I came up with this one for you um, today. So let's have a look at some of this information. First of all, your contact information, as I mentioned before, you um, some people would use three lines or four lines if you're trying to create extra space in your document to fill up two full pages. What's not listed here is a LinkedIn profile, but you can definitely get a LinkedIn URL and include that as well. Because remember, you're, if you have lots and lots of experiences, you're not necessarily showing the employer all of those things. You're just showing them what's relevant to you in this particular instance as it relates to this job. But your LinkedIn profile can show more of who you are and what your experiences are. So if you invite them to go to your LinkedIn profile, they can see the bigger picture of you. And, they don't, and that way you're not concerned about missing out on, on being able to tell them something really great about you that maybe not be relevant to the job, but it's important to you. So they can see that on LinkedIn. Okay, um, then we have a section for uh, summary of qualifications. You can call this highlights. You can just call it summary. You can call it whatever you want. We do recommend you use one though. Um, I know that if you're in Ivy, Ivy would not recommend this. So it is industry specific, but in general, we recommend that this is useful because why? I talked about that upper one third of your document being the high real estate piece of what you need to show employers. Six seconds. They're looking at your document for six seconds. You want to hook them. So talk about what's great about you right at the top. And then because your education is probably the next most recent thing that you're doing, it generally comes next. And as mentioned, we, we use the whole uh, name of your degree. So a Bachelor of Arts majoring in history with an honor specialization, okay? Um, if you're on the Dean's List, you can put information here. If you've won academic scholarships, you can put things here. If you've taken courses that are relevant to the field of what you're applying for, to the industry or the type of work you're applying for, you can list them here. You don't list course codes, you just list the name of the subjects. And if you could list three, two or three, it would be fine to include this information here. Alternately, none of that could be relevant. You might just want to list your degree and the dates that you started and ended and that you've done it at Western University. Or you could, of course, say the University of Western Ontario. That works too. So this can be as long or as short as you want, depending upon what, what information is relevant for you to include. Okay, I talked before about that myth and fact about where you have to put your experience. Do you need to separate it out from paid experience? Not necessarily. We can use a generic term of experience. And again, maybe your varsity athletic, uh, um, athletic experience is the most relevant because of the skills you've obtained from that. And so here's some bullet points here that could be done, could be something that you could talk about. Uh, and then, so, so what you're seeing in this example here is a, is a chronological or, a, um, yeah, a chronological resume where your experiences are listed with the most recent 
working backwards from there. Most recent working backwards. But what do you, if you what do you do if the the most relevant thing you want to tell the employer is like the third thing on your list? There's no guarantee they're still reading, right? So you can bump that up to the top by changing this title to relevant experience. Relevant experience, and then starting with most, what's most recent, and then underneath that you could put other experience. Or I've seen people use headings that have, don't even say experience. It'll say like leadership. It's the, the heading is based on the skill. So the skill is leadership. And maybe the next skill might be um, communication. And maybe the next skill after that might be uh, time management and organization, because these are the skills that were highlighted in that job posting that they saw from the employer. So you, you can be very creative. And that's why I said, there's no rules around any of this. The only guidelines we have are relevant, accomplishment-based, and easy to read with no errors. Beyond that, what you do with the body of your resume is up to you. So this is just an example of a reverse chronological style, but you can choose to, to play with it in different ways. And again, there's lots of resumes on our website uh, that can show you different formats. I would encourage you to look beyond the job titles because when you see the posting or you see the, um, the resumes on our website, it'll say like marketing intern or uh, engineer in training. And you might think, well, I'm not any of those things. So I'm not gonna look at that resume, but we have them on our website because we like the formatting or we like things that they've done. So have a look at them anyway and, and see if that can help prompt you with some ideas. Okay. other. Um, uh, headings that you might want to consider are awards or achievements, other experiences, um, volunteer or extracurricular. If you want to include that, you can. And then if you've gotten any certifications like um, first aid, uh, you know, coaching certificates, anything like that, that could be relevant, you'd want to include that there as well. Okay, and that's pretty much the nut of it. I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, whoops, let me back that up. Uh, where you can find us, so career.uwo.ca, and then under the heading for prepare, you'll find a heading for resumes, cover letters, CVs, and here you'll find not only content on our, like written content on our website, but there's an e-learning module called Complete Student where you can learn more. There's a service called Western's Employment Resource Center, or WORK, for short, Western's Employment Resource Center. These are student leaders who provide feedback on resumes and cover letters and LinkedIn profiles. So, uh, and that's available through drop-in sessions until class is finished on April 12th. And then also available through email, through e-advising all through the summer. So I encourage you to check that out. There's also other ways we meet with students. So again, we offer workshops and they're finished for the term now because we're into the end of March, but you can find these on our website as well as on our YouTube channel. All the sessions we offered all term long. So networking, interviewing, job searching, resumes, life design, all kinds of things are there uh, and they're all one hour long. As mentioned before, we do one-on-one -on -one sessions. Uh, you can book an appointment and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a career educator. We have Western's Employment Resource Center to offer you support with your documents. And then of course, we just have uh, you know, a variety of resources on our website in general for you to access at your convenience. And that's it, so I'm open to some questions now. I think I'm a few minutes ahead maybe. Just a little bit, but that gives us more time for questions. <laughs> I usually do this as an hour session, so I had to chop it back significantly. So I feel like I may, you know, there's all this information I could have given you otherwise. So please feel free to ask questions. Um, I know personally, I would enjoy hearing a little bit more about uh, your position at Western and, and a little bit more in depth about what you do. Mm -hmm. So um, in in one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions, um, I meet with students from main campus, from our affiliates. We also provide services to students who convocated within one year. So don't think that after you graduate, that's it, you're on your own. Western always has a blanket wrapped around you. We are always here to support you. So you can access the services from my department for one year after you convocate. So not after you finish classes in your coursework, but after you convocate. So if you're finishing this year, 
I mean, I know it's pandemic times and I feel so sad for you that you will, you will pa- graduate in a pandemic, but it would be June when you would convocate. So services are available to you until June, 2022. Beyond that, alumni services offers uh, career management services as well. And you can access those five years out, 10 years out, however many years out you want to come back and ask questions, we're available for you. So in my role, I meet with students uh, from main campus and the affiliates, and I meet with recent alumni as well. These are one-on-one sessions that last 45 minutes to an hour. If you haven't visited us before, you do have to attend an information session, like an introductory session first, which is just a 15 minute appointment that it's an opportunity for us to triage what your career questions and concerns are and then how we can best meet that need. Beyond that, once you've had one introductory session, you can come in for the longer session. There are no limits to those. You can have as many sessions as you need. So you might need one, You might need five. It doesn't matter. You get what you need and we're there for you. We do offer a mock interview service as well where you can practice interviewing skills and there is a limit on that. There is one mock interview per term that you're entitled to. But this is a great time of year because you can get one in now if you have time in your schedule. And then you can also sneak one in in the summer term as well because it is a different term than what we're in right now. And that mock interview lasts about an hour as well. Mm, Wonderful. It's great to know that those resources are available. Um, We do also have a question from Mm -hmm. Candice. Um, She says, I think a struggle for many athletes are that they are graduating with fantastic grades and limited work experience due to the time spent training. Do you have any suggestions or experiences they can seek out to help them with their next steps? So I am Candice, I just want to clarify. So next steps in gaining experience? Job or career? Job or career. You know, Candice, I would argue that you have lots of experience from your time as an athlete, right? Um, And that is transferable to the workforce. And it's absolutely true, exactly what you're saying, that because of the time commitment spent towards your athletics and towards your degree and, and to get strong grades in your degree, there's no time left for other things. But that's where you can use your sport experience to show the connection between the skills you offer. So you gotta think beyond what you did and think about the skills that you used. Also, your academics is a great way to express some of the skills that you gained. I'm sure throughout your academics, you've done group work where you've had to you know, manage with, work with people that you didn't know before. And you had to work with people who are better with deadlines than others. I'm sure there might've been even conflict management in there where some person in the group wasn't pulling their weight, right? So you can speak to that experience of of leadership or problem solving or communication or teamwork. All of those things come from your academics as well. Maybe you've done research through your academics. Maybe you've had to critically analyze data and information if you've ever had to write papers, right? Or essays. So all of those skills count, even though it might not have been from a paid experience. So don't discount the experience you've had as an athlete or the skills you gain from um, your academics as well, because that's available there. And in terms of getting experiences, it's a tough time right now because of the pandemic. So I would look to look to um, industries that are kind of um, pandemic proof, if you will, you know, Um, health health, the health sector, I don't know what your background is, what you're studying, but there's lots of work available in the healthcare sector right now. There's lots of work available in, um, you know, logistics and delivery and things like that. Um, uh, Agriculture is a biggie right now. Um, Again, that that would require a more one-on-one conversation. But what I'm hoping to to drive home here for you is that I do appreciate what you're saying in that you don't don't have time to, to have a job on top of being an athlete and being a strong student. And so what are you going to do? You might think I've got nothing to tell an employer. I can tell you employers value high performance athletes because you bring something to the table that the average person who has maybe lots of experiences as volunteers and club work and summer jobs might not bring. And those are things like quick decision making, strategic thinking, collaboration, focus, driven, you know, those kinds of things. So use the experiences you have find the skills within them and market those because they are highly transferable. You're welcome.
Perfect. Uh, that does conclude our time for questions. Um, I just want to thank you so much, Teresa, for providing us with some exceptional advice. Uh, I really enjoyed the introduction where you debunked uh, common myths and uh, expanded on the subjectivity of resumes. Uh, your breakdown of relevancy, accomplishment statements, and making your resume uh, easy to read and straightforward was extremely helpful and practical. And I know that I'll be using that uh, moving forward. Um, and I know uh, I personally really appreciate all the resources that were provided. Uh, I'll be using, utilizing them myself and I'm, I'm sure our audience will as well. <laughs> um. That's great. Yeah, so uh, we, we like the idea of being able to meet students in person or providing services available uh, online because recognizing that as athletes, you might not be able to get to us between 8.30 and 4.30. And so the same information is available to oh, you wonderful. online as it's well. It's great to know that. <laughs> Um, so that does conclude mm -hmm. our conference. Uh, what an inspiring conference. Thank you to all our incredible speakers, panelists, and moderators for sharing your wisdom, experiences, insights, and expertise with us today, as well as our organizing committee for making this happen. And thanks to all of you who took the time to attend. This concludes our Stay in the Game Pathways for Women in Sports virtual conference. We hope you have been inspired by some of these experiences and encouraged to consider what opportunities and pathways may exist for you in sport. A feedback survey, resource list, and information on how to access some of the conference presentations will be sent to you by email. Uh, we want to once again thank our presenting sponsors, Tourism London and Western Mustangs, as well as our silver sponsors, Brescia University College, See What She Can Do, Western Driving Academy, Western Mustangs Athletic Alumni, and London Police. Have a great weekend. <laughs>